All right, kids, second to last chapter of the entire year. We're almost there. Home stretch. We're finishing up the 20th century by talking about East Asia. So we started the 20th century by talking about the World Wars and the Great Depression. We got into the late 20th century by talking about the Cold War and focusing primarily on Western Europe, the United States, the rise of the two superpowers. We then spent the last couple chapters talking about how the Cold War in particular, as well as the 20th century in general, impacted the rest of the world. So we talked about Latin America and the instability and the economic growth and decline that we see in a lot of those countries. And then most recently we talked about Africa and the Middle East and portions of Asia. And we saw a lot of the same patterns, instability, um, mostly economic decline or at least stasis, not really able to get the ball rolling and really develop. One of the things that's different as we get to this last, really, I guess, content heavy chapter, um, because the last chapter in your book is really about 20th and 21st century trends. What's going to happen next in history? This last real history chapter is focused on East Asia. And we're actually going to see some very different trends in a lot of these countries. We are going to see growth. We are going to see stability. And so it raises some really interesting questions of why. Why was this part of the world, which was colonized just like the rest of it, why was this able to not follow the same path as Africa or Latin America? Why were they able to stabilize and grow economically? Um, and we do have answers to some of those questions, but we don't necessarily have full answers to some of those questions. But that's what we want to take a look at today. So we're going to start with just a couple of trends or themes. And then we're really going to delve into a series of case studies. Um, again, a lot of this is very SOL driven. Um, for your state test next, no, not next week, the week after. Um, so things like the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the revolution in China. Um, all of that hits a lot of the state standards as well as AP content, so we're kind of double dipping here. All right, so post-World War II in East Asia. Things seem to fall into one of two categories. Um, either recolonization or division and restructuring. And we put those last two terms together. So either the Europeans attempt to come back and retake these colonies now that the wars are passed or they acknowledge the fact that it's too difficult to maintain and they try to assist in restructuring and reorganizing some of these countries. Now, some of them are just going to be able to break away entirely and set themselves up on their own. And that's where we're going to get into some of the case studies. We're also going to see that these societies will, for a variety of reasons, develop differently than a lot of countries in Latin America or Africa or the Middle East. And there are some reasons for that too that we'll talk about. But we're going to jump right into some examples of what we're talking about. We're going to look at Japan, Korea, and Vietnam in particular to start as examples of either recolonization or division and restructuring. So let me jump over to this page where we'll talk specifically about Japan and Korea. So in Japan, at the end of World War II, how does the war end? In Japan, at the end of World War II, how does the war end? Mari? Good. Atomic bombs dropped on Japan, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Japan surrenders unconditionally. As a part of the peace agreement, the United States promises to help Japan rebuild. And they also promise to help Japan reorganize its government to create something that's more representative and more democratic. If you were Japanese and you had be just been defeated, how would you feel about your conqueror coming in and helping you reset? 
scared, upset, suspicious, all of those things. Surprisingly, especially from the way that your textbook describes it, the Japanese seem to be fairly receptive to this. You don't see a lot of residual animosity. There is some, but they seem to be able to separate war from peacetime. Um, and I've actually read accounts from Japanese soldiers themselves who, from their perspective, war was war. And you tried to win and you did whatever you could to win, but then if you lost, okay, no hard feelings. And if you won, same thing. Nick? I still understand how Japan is able to go from doing stuff like crashing planes into ships and um, doing human wave attacks where you just throw walls and walls of people at the enemy to accepting defeat and just sitting there. Well, it's not just sitting there. There's always a purpose, and purpose is one of the things that allows people to move forward, whether it's in a time of war or a time of peace. If your purpose is to try to annihilate the enemy, then that's what you do. And if your purpose is to try to rebuild and move on, then that's what you do. So purpose is very, very important. But some of this is also where East Asia differs. One of the things that has always united China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam is a particular philosophy, which is Confucianism. And if you remember, Confucianism, which does several things, primarily teaches obedience to the state. You know your place in society, and you obey your leaders. Now, it doesn't always work perfectly, but this is one of the fundamental bedrock millennia old principles that has held each of these societies together and that is going to be one of the fundamental differences when East Asia is recovering from the world wars they have a system in place in each of their societies where as long as there is a relatively stable government the government can say we're going to do this and everybody else says okay let's go Rather than, I don't know, that seems like a pretty stupid idea. You're going to have to prove to me why we should do that. I don't think we should do that at all. I think we should do this instead, and I'm not going to move until somebody listens to my opinion. They don't really have to deal with that. Again, not that everybody's on board, but they seem to be able to get most people moving in the same direction relatively quickly. And so what you see in Japan is that Japan rebuilds under U.S. occupation because they recognize the fact that this is what it is. I mean, we just lost the war. We signed the peace treaty. This is what it is. It's like when Matthew Perry showed up in the 1800s. It is what it is. He's here. He's got the guns. We just have to do this. And for many Japanese people, they've already had representative government. It's not a new thing. It's not a brand new idea that they don't have any familiarity with. They have had the diet before. Remember, just after Matthew Perry shows up, they have that teenage emperor that helps restructure Japan during the Meiji Restoration. And they brought in that German-style parliament. It's not a new thing for them. They're like, okay, this will probably work. Plus, we've just seen the abuse of the military power. We've just seen what happens when we allow the military generals to have too much authority. We don't want to go back to that. So, yes, let's embrace democracy. That's not a bad thing. Um, some committed ritual suicide, some were taken for war crimes, some just merged into civilian life. So, I mean, not that different from most any other conflict or any other country, minus the ritual suicide part. So, what do you do when you embrace democracy? Well, you give women the vote. They do that. No problems. You focus a little bit more on gender equity. Okay. Okay. 20th century. It's not tough. It does become a little tricky for women, though, because especially in Japan, they do want to try to maintain traditional women's roles. And so the reason why I say this gets trickier is now the woman is kind of expected to be part of the workforce and do all the stuff at home. So you know, it kind of begs the question, did things get better or did things just get worse for women? I mean, on the one hand, yeah, they've got these economic opportunities now, 
and that's great and they're able to be in the workforce and contribute to the family income and have that independence and that upward no mobility for themselves but by the same token to still have the expectations at home as well to many people that just starts to seem a little bit unrealistic because it's not like they're asking the guy you know go work a 40-hour work week and come home and take care of the kids and take care of the house so the double standard does still seem to exist And the United States, as part of this reconstruction, also pushes to end the state adoption or the state continuation of the practice of Shintoism. There was probably a little bit more resistance to that part than anything else because, again, forcing people to change what they believe in is a very, very tricky proposition. But given the other belief systems that Japan has gone through, Buddhism, Christianity, there were enough other options available that I think a fair number of people were able to adapt and or just continue to practice in private. You go to Japan today, you still see Shinto temples. You still see the Tori arch all over the place. So it's not as if those things have been completely removed. Yeah, Emily? In Japan today... I would say Buddhism, there's definitely a growing Christian population. I don't think it's outpaced Buddhism yet. I could be wrong. I think it is Buddhism. Nick? Did the Christians ever go away or after the Japanese went to their isolation policy? Did they just completely disappear and were just going hiding? European Christians or Japanese Christians? Japanese. Um, more into hiding or you know just not being as public with their faith um, so the last two things here as part of this US reconstruction Martin Luther again right as part of this US reconstruction the United States does not allow Japan to remilitarize we don't quite trust them yet much like with Germany we're going to help them rebuild, but we don't trust them to have an independent military yet. Now, for Japan, on the one hand, this is you know a little bit disrespectful. It's a little bit humiliating, not being able to defend yourself with your own soldiers. But there is a silver lining to this. What's that silver lining? Steven? The U.S. will protect them. Good. And so all the money that they would otherwise have to spend on national defense, on maintaining a standing army and all of the equipment and the planes and the tanks and the ships and everything else, they now get to use that money to invest in their economy. That just frees up anywhere between 5 and 15% of their gross domestic product. If somebody handed me an extra 15% of my income... I would be deliriously happy. I can't even begin to tell you how much of a difference that would make in my lifestyle. And that's a relatively small dollar amount that we're talking. For a country to get 5 to 15% of their revenue back that they can spend on something else, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars. That makes a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, gross domestic product, it's... It's basically a country's income, how much money they make between taxes and um, imports, or not imports, exports, um, things like that. There's a lot of math that goes into figuring out how much a country is worth each year. <sighs> Tax dollars mostly, um, tariffs and trade, things like that. Um, financing other countries, especially loans, things like that. Um, you guys are now part of the class that all have to take economics next year. Yeah. So we're going to spend a lot of time on GDP next year. Well, I mean, all of us. Yeah. Did you know that Japan and the Soviet Union never signed a peace treaty? So technically, 
I did not know that. Much like Korea. All right. Speaking of Korea. After World War II, there was some disagreement over what to do with Korea because the Japanese had conquered it. And so much like with other places the Japanese had conquered, we wanted to give it its independence. The problem is we needed, or we thought we needed, Russia's help in defeating Japan. While the war was still going, we were fairly convinced that we needed Russia's help to ultimately defeat Japan. And so that meant that we had to give them something in order to encourage them to gear up and turn around after fighting the Nazis and head east to go fight Japan. And so one of the things that that meant was we kind of agreed to partition Korea, a lot like we ended up partitioning Germany. Cut it into north and southern halves. Some shared responsibility for rebuilding, a little bit like Japan, a little bit like Germany. And what we come to find in the years immediately after World War II is that North Korea embraces communism because they're basically sponsored by the Soviet Union. And with the encouragement of the Soviet Union, who wanted to see communism spread, again, that idea of containment, domino theory, all of that, with a little bit of Soviet encouragement, the people in North Korea decide that they want to reunify Korea under a single government like it had been, but they want it to be their government not the more democratic government that was taking place in South Korea. Yes, Nick? Now, for the Korean War, was the um, Maoist Chinese also backing them at the very beginning along with the Russians? Yeah. Now, what's going to end up happening? Yeah, Mari? Do what? What gave them the authority to split up Korea? Um, well, right, essentially they won. And so in taking away Japan's colonies, the Europeans, and again, remember that a lot of this had been colonized previously by Europeans, and then Japan and Russia and Japan and China had fought, in, had fought, in? Yes. Had fought over portions of East Asia. It wasn't that funny. <laughs> Well, I make up words all the time. Foughten doesn't even make the top ten. Okay, fair enough. But, Mar, to answer your question, the biggest reason is, is because the United States and the Soviet Union won. And from their perspective, that allowed them to dictate terms to everybody else in terms of what was going to happen. So the short version of this conflict is that North Korea invades. They conquer almost all of South Korea. At that point, the United States decides that it's not enough to just send aid and send supplies. And so Douglas MacArthur and a fair amount of the United States Marines go to Korea and actually engage in a land war. And they push the North Koreans back, back up to the original starting line, dividing the country, and then begin to push them up beyond that, almost back to the borders of China. And at that point, there's some funny things that happen. We'll get to that in a second because there's questions. Stephen? Uh, if it weren't for China, would there be no North Korea? Uh, probably not that far. Uh, probably more like 20 years. But probably because they would still have had Soviet support. And again, one of the things you have to remember about the Cold War, we are always afraid of getting to the point of what? Nuclear Right, a nuclear exchange. Dun, dun, dun. Trina, you know the lights are off, right? Oh, no, okay. I was just, I was experimenting to see if you'd catch it. Yeah, because it's May, and we're still figuring this out. Okay, anyway. So, very, very long story made much shorter, because again, this is a three-year conflict. 
we push the North Korean army all the way back to the border with China. Douglas MacArthur gets a little trigger happy and wants to use nuclear weapons on China. After China enters the war, and the United States decides, after a moment of thought, that using nuclear weapons on the world's most populated communist country is probably not a good idea. And MacArthur and the president have a bit of a falling out, and MacArthur is removed from duty. And the North Koreans then, supported by China and the Soviet Union, counterattack. And after three years of fighting, the border goes just about back to where it was at the start of the conflict. So in terms of territory gained and lost, not much is accomplished. In terms of impact, there's 10 million casualties between killed and wounded. And in terms of impact, this becomes one of the hallmarks of Cold War proxy wars, where both sides are fighting just enough to try to get what they want, but both are stopping short of using their full military might, which means nuclear weapons. Yes? We're trying to keep it simple because we're doing a whole chapter in one day and they're not going to remember all that okay so interestingly enough what then happens in South Korea which remains under the support and the watchful eye of the United States is economic development and what happens in North Korea under the watchful eye of the Soviet Union and China is a relative lack of economic development. And that situation remains until present day. North Korea today remains communist and largely underdeveloped. South Korea today remains democratic and is one of the growing economic powers in East Asia and in the world. I think they're one of the top ten economies in the world. A question over here? Yeah. Right. Both countries would actually love to unite, but only under their own terms. So North Korea would love to unify the Korean Peninsula, but only as long as they could do it with them in charge. And South Korea, likewise, but to a lesser extent, wouldn't mind being unified, but certainly not under a North Korean government. And so we're kind of at an impasse. Now, even to this day, North Korea still likes to make threats every once in a while about how they're going to invade South Korea, slash shoot rockets, slash if they ever get it, use a nuclear weapon. Um, and by and large, South Korea and the rest of the world ignores that as bluster. Um, but as a result, you still have a five-mile barrier between those two countries called the Demilitarized Zone, the DMZ. And there's barbed wire fences and guardhouses and men with machine guns and attack dogs patrolling both sides of it, making sure that hostilities do not resurface because this war never ends. They sign a ceasefire. They do not sign a peace treaty. So if you want to look at it this way, they've just called a timeout. Now, it's a timeout that's lasted for 60 years, but it's technically a timeout. And if they wanted to resume hostilities, nobody would be breaking a treaty. The timeout would have just ended. And that's one of the things that makes people nervous in that part of the world. Yes, ma'am? Um, North Korea, like, do people Yes, and people often try to. Do they work? Sometimes. Is this a lengthy deliberation on information that we don't necessarily need or is this a question? No, it's deliberation. Okay, we're going to come back to it then. Long story short, we keep a lot of troops in Yes. Okay, so coming back to some of these big ideas then.
Next stop on our East Asian tour, we're going to talk a little bit about China and Taiwan. <coughs> what about what? what? Vietnam. Oh, Vietnam. Okay. Um, Vietnam is a lot like Korea. It's split north and south following the war. The northern portion, supported by the Soviet Union, becomes communist. Initially, before we get to that, immediately following World War II, we said there were typically two options, recolonization or division and restructuring. After World War II, France decides to recolonize what they called French Indochina, which is this part of the world right here. So Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand. France had colonized that during the period of European imperialism in the 1800s. And then during and after World War I, France had to leave because they were getting beat up by Germany. They also had some other issues that were going on. Just let it go. Hang on. OK. What happens then after? World War II starts is the Japanese begin to carve out their Pacific Empire and in addition to conquering Korea and coastal China they also come down and they conquer Vietnam and then move on to the Philippines and all those other Pacific Islands. So the Vietnamese have to fight multiple wars for independence first against the French then against the Japanese. Then when World War II ends and Japan's colonies get taken away from them the Vietnamese feel rightfully so liberated. They feel free. They feel like they've got their country back now and they can go and develop on their own. And then the French come knocking and they're like, hey, we're back. Did you miss us? The Vietnamese are like, no. Well, if you're European, apparently. And so the French come back and they attempt to recolonize. And at this point, the Vietnamese show that they have learned a whole lot about guerrilla style warfare in fighting the Japanese during World War II. And the French are relative, well, rather embarrassed in their attempts to recolonize. Um, there's some great video about how the Vietnamese fight the French. Um, their use of guerrilla tactics, underground tunnels, booby traps, all of that stuff. Just remarkable innovation and initiative. Um, but the short version is that the French are ultimately defeated. The last battle happens at a fort called Dien Bien Phu and the French surrender and they leave. And now if you're the Vietnamese, you're like, yes, finally. Not only did we get you know, a little bit of revenge against white man over there, but we're free. Well, it just so happens that the leader of this newly independent Vietnam espouses communist principles, which if you're the United States raises a giant flag and we decide that we need to go to Vietnam to stop the spread of communism and liberate the Vietnamese people from communism. Your question. Yeah. I thought the French maintained control until World War II where the Germans forced their puppet government to give the territory to Japan. Well, they maintained control, but that control was definitely weakened after World War I. They wanted to hang on to the rubber production that they had going on in Southeast Asia. Um, distance and money made it more difficult but at any rate so this then leads to a very similar but much longer conflict than Korea uh, rather than three years this one goes on for eh, depending on how you want to count it 15 years unlike in Korea where the border is reestablished more or less where it started Vietnam is eventually unified under that communist government. And the United States, after five years of direct military involvement, which came at the end of almost 10 years of military support and guidance and things like that, decides to just pack their bags and come home. Yes. Ish, yeah. Much well, not quite like Cuba, not quite like China, but yeah. Nick? Didn't we leave a promise to the South Vietnamese that we would come back if they ever got attacked before or when we actually? 
We may have, I don't know. But as we were leaving, they were being attacked. So. I think we did, and then we had a um, government change, and the new party didn't want to. Well, Vietnam had become a wildly unpopular war in the United States, and it was hard for any party to really, ra to really rally the American people's support for continued involvement there. People just wanted to be done which then makes it really, really hard for the returning Vietnam veterans to get much in the way of respect or appreciation when they come back. Yeah. Oh, geez, that's a really good question. Um, short version. Um, some of it has to do with the fact that many Americans were beginning to believe during that point in the Cold War that it was not our job to be the world's policemen. And just because something bad might be happening someplace else, it wasn't our job to go and try to stop it. There was also the sense that in Vietnam in particular, it wasn't our job to go and try to maintain this idea of Western colonialism. You know, allow them to be independent, even if we don't necessarily like their ideology. Some of it had to do with the fact that Americans felt like we went into the war under false pretenses, kind of like the Iraq war with the weapons of mass destruction. Um, in Vietnam's case, it was an incident called the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, one of our naval vessels was just off the coast of North Vietnam. It reported being fired upon. Um, allegedly 30 some odd torpedoes were fired at this ship. None of them hit and half the crew swears up and down they never even saw one or heard one. But at any rate, the new president, Lyndon Johnson, um, who has only been in office for a couple of months since John F. Kennedy's assassination, um, signs a declaration that sends American military personnel into Vietnam in a combat capacity. And it all happens very, very quickly, and there are lots of people that question whether or not it was really necessary, whether or not it was really provoked, whether it should have happened at all. And then when the war doesn't go well, you know, that's always the thing. Winning solves a lot of problems, and winning ends a lot of arguments. Losing causes more arguments. And that's whether you want to call it winning or losing with Vietnam, because there was some good that came out of it. There were lives that were positively impacted, but there was also a lot of damage. And again, that makes it very, very difficult from the American public standpoint, because they want nice, quick fixes. And they're not getting that. Question or comment? Yeah, question. Could you call our struggle in Vietnam a struggle for independence or a Well, it depends on your perspective. There were certainly many in the government and the military that felt like we were liberating Vietnam from communism, and they felt like that was a very worthy cause. There were some that I think were looking at it more from a standpoint of conquest, and we want to gain this territory. Um, so again, it would depend on who you asked. Well, from the Vietnamese perspective, absolutely it was. And for them, it was the next in a long line of independence movements against the French, against the Japanese, against the French again, and now against the United States. Okay, next topic. China. China during World War II, like most of these other places, is conquered by Japan. Just before World War II breaks out, China has been having this internal dispute between communists and nationalists. Mao Zedong and the Communists against Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists. And the Nationalists were actually doing a pretty good job of holding their own slash almost winning. And then the Japanese invaded. And now both sides, the Communists and the Nationalists, have to find a way to attempt to make peace with each other in order to fight this new common enemy. And they do a really bad job of it. Japan. Right, and Chiang Kai-shek in particular really hated the communists and did a lot to try to undermine them even as they're trying to work together to fight the Japanese. So long story short, the Chinese communists actually end up looking a whole lot better than the Chinese nationalists in the eyes of the average Chinese person. Because your average Chinese peasant sees the communists really fighting against the Japanese and I see the nationalists doing a really bad job of fighting against the Japanese. They see 
the nationalist military forces getting their butts whooped by Japan. And they see the communist forces engaging in a very, very successful guerrilla style campaign. They see the nationalists having to rely on more and more support from foreign countries like the United States. And they see the communists doing a much better job of holding their own. And so because of the war, the tide turns in China in terms of the group that people support. So when World War II ends and this internal conflict resumes, Mao Zedong and his communist party suddenly find themselves being the clear favorite. And after, you know, this Chinese revolution, the Chinese civil war, the nationalists find themselves being ousted. And they get the boot across the water to the island of what will now become known as Taiwan. Didn't Chiang Kai-shek almost win his revolution militarily right after the war? Mm -hmm. But he didn't. He did. Now, what will happen in China is really convoluted. And I know that when you do actually read this part of the textbook, you're going to be confused because there is a lot going on. The short version, I know I keep saying that a lot because we're trying to condense something that really just can't be condensed. Mao Zedong and the communists try to make China into a true communist state. They look at Russia, especially Russia after Stalin dies, and they see Russia as kind of abandoning the true teachings of communism. And Mao actually kind of adopts this belief that he is the last true champion of communism still standing, and it's up to him to do it right for everybody else. That's a lot of pressure to put on yourself. And so he tries a couple of things. He tries a lot of things, but two big ones. The Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Now, the Great Leap Forward was an attempt to massively move China forward industrially and economically. And it really does not work well. Because in true communist fashion, Mao decides that the best way to do this is to focus on the peasants. So rather than massive countrywide industrialization, he decides, you know what, we're going to let all of the peasants individually do like mini industrialization, like backyard industrialization. Like we're going to try to provide all of the peasants with the means of producing better equipment on their own. Now the government's going to have to tell them exactly what to do because they don't know how to do it. But we're going to try to do this from the ground up instead of from the top down. Now here's the problem. China has three quarters of a billion people at this point most of them peasants. How do you get 500, 600 billion people to all do the same thing at the same time and do it willingly? I mean, I can barely get the 31 of you to do the same thing at the same time. And by barely, I mean I can't. I mean, just as soon as I get Tarina to stop texting, ever starts. It's crazy. I mean, I saw it like 10 minutes ago, but I let it go because at least you're quiet. So my point is, there is. Plus, you know, the upside of Mao is he's got military control and he can kill people that don't do what he wants to do. So short version of this no you're not the only one I pick on you're just louder than most everybody else yeah you're just more obvious plus it's fun anyway so great leap forward if this helps is actually a giant leap backwards I'm just about to give up. Yeah, how many of you are going to read this chapter if I don't finish talking about it? <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, that's my point. All right, so Great Leap Forward actually does a lot of damage to China. It alienates the peasantry from the Communist Party, and it seriously curtails their industrial development. It sets them back because they weren't focusing on industrialization from a national perspective. They were trying to do it from the peasant class up, and it was horribly inefficient. So a little bit of time goes by. People are, you know, not happy. Crop production is down. Industrial production is down. China's overall production as a country drops like 25%. I mean, it's horrific. So then Mao decides that we can get everybody back on board with like an ultra super duper communist cultural revolution. We are going to make people idolize the peasant lifestyle. And we are going to force all of the elites in China, um, business people, engineers, teachers, they qualify as elites by the way because they have lots of knowledge about outside things. They're all going to publicly apologize for abusing you know, the people and the people's faith in them and for being so elitist and everybody's going to try to emulate the peasants and have a peasant existence and that's going to make China great and it doesn't and that really ticks off a lot of people and Mao is kind of on the way out at that point. The Communist Party, however, is able to maintain control. And so China, to this day, is a one-party country. And the entire country, from the national level all the way down to the local level, are run by representatives of the Communist Party, to this day. Now, they are not truly a communist nation. They have far more capitalistic trends than they would ever be willing to admit publicly. But they still profess to be a true communist nation and they are run by a single party, the Communist Party, and have been since Mao. So despite the mistakes of Mao and the Communist Party, China is still on this track. And it's one of the things that has made it difficult for them to address some of the problems and issues that they have. Well, civil unrest for one, because as we get through the end of the 20th century and into the 21st, the Chinese people really start to get tired of being oppressed, having limited rights, having limited economic development. They still have lots and lots of people living out in the countryside that might as well still be living 100 years ago. They resent the fact that with 21st century technology that they're not necessarily able to use it. Um, there was actually an issue what's today, the third? Two days ago. Um, May 1st is typically National Workers' Day, which is a huge socialist communist holiday because it celebrates the life of the average worker, the, you know, the, the backbone of society. And in China, they prevented via the internet and Twitter and all other social media, any conversation threads involving the use of worker or socialist or communist or anything else. So even in a communist nation, they weren't allowed to talk about communism because it might lead people to bring up how dissatisfied they are. One of the biggest visual examples of this comes in 1989 at Tiananmen Square, which is a public protest against the government started by students that are dissatisfied with, their, with the restrictions that are placed on them. Um, it culminates in a tens of thousands of persons demonstration in the public square in front of the Forbidden City. And it ends with the Chinese military coming in to break up the protest. And while the Chinese government refuses to acknowledge this, thousands of people were killed in an attempt to make these people go home and go away and stop protesting. This becomes one of the iconic moments of this protest when a single solitary figure stands in the way of a line of tanks coming into Tiananmen Square. And the tanks try to go around him and he keeps moving and they try to go around the other way and he keeps moving until finally the tanks stop and he climbs up on the first tank and tries to plead with the driver to stop and turn around at which point the tanks start moving so he jumps down and he stands in front of him again. And you're just waiting to see this guy get squished because it's the, it's the Chinese military. Clearly they don't care about this one person and yet for whatever reason 
The driver of the tank refuses to take that route. And so this standoff goes on for minutes on end, and it's really this very powerful statement about what a single determined person can do against a government they're dissatisfied with. And this is also typically where American teenagers want to make jokes and things like that. And as long as you can appreciate the, the severity of the moment, that's great. Paul? Uh, what happened to the Honestly, don't know. Nick? Right. So at any rate, that civil unrest still goes on today as well. Now, real quick, two last things. Like we said, East Asia develops very, very differently from Africa and Latin America. Latin America and Africa really struggle to get their economies going. To, they really struggle with unstable governments, military coups, things like that. There are two groups in East Asia that have done a really good job of bucking that trend and have been wildly successful since the end of World War II. And you have one group called the Four Dragons, which is South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, that have economies that are wildly successful today and have been steadily growing for the last 20 or 30 years. And you have another group called the Little Tigers, which is Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, that are up and coming. Right. And again, they're showing that it's possible to break that trend of economic, you know, rise and fall and decline and corruption and chaos and all of that. And again, a lot of that has to do, well, some of it has to do with the fact that their populations are a little bit less diverse than in Latin America and Africa, where people have been forcibly combined into countries and organizations where they conflict with each other they don't seem to have as much of a problem with that in East Asia that's certainly an element in their favor again also the Confucian impact of civil obedience and collaboration in society has gone a long way towards helping them as well so in summary East Asia has taken a very very different 20th century path than Latin America or Africa. So as you're looking at post-war trends and themes, you can usually make some common comparisons between Africa and Latin America, and you can usually make some pretty significant contrasts between East Asia and the rest of the developing world. For a number of reasons, they've been able to take a very different and very successful path into the 21st century, and it seems like it's continuing. They really haven't hit too many hiccups in that process whereas we've seen lots of starts and stops in the rest of the developing world. So, like I said, that's the last history chapter in your textbook. Chapter 36 is going to deal a little bit with the end of the Cold War, but it's mostly going to deal with the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st and a lot of the trends that we see taking place moving forward. Globalization, uh, the integration of global economies, technology and where it's going, um, a lot of the things that you are living, historians are trying to figure out where is it going. They're trying to take the last 6,000 years worth of civilized history and figure out what it means for the next 50 years or 100 years or 200 years. This is where history actually starts to become practical and has a practical application. It's much like in your own life. You've got now 16 years worth of life experience. The hope is that after looking backwards for a while and seeing what you've done well and where you haven't made good decisions, water bottle flicker, thank you, that you can then begin to project forward and make better decisions about what to do and what not to do in the future. And that's really what history is used for. History is not just memorizing names and dates and facts and dealing with dusty books. I'll see you all later. Have a good weekend.